In this short video, we're going to review the mathematical ideas of relations and functions. Mathematics, a relation is just a set of ordered pairs, meaning that you have a set of pairs of numbers. You put them inside parentheses. You have a first coordinate and you have a second coordinate. The set of the first coordinates, or we might call the inputs, is the domain. Where the set of the second coordinates, or the outputs, is called the range. A relation may be represented in many ways. If you have a small number of ordered pairs, you really have a couple of choices. You could list them in a set notation and you just simply write out each ordered pair or still if you have a small number you may make a diagram where you draw an arrow showing which input gets with mapped onto which output now usually the relations that interest us are represented by the solutions of an equation in two variables where your x variable represents your inputs and your y variable represents your output or rather than just looking at the algebraic equation we may plot the solutions in a graph and look at them that way what about functions well, a function is a special kind of relation. And what makes it special? Well, each member of the domain is paired with exactly one member of the range. That is, for each x, there is exactly one y. So you'll see that a relation does not represent a function if there are two ordered pairs where you have the same first coordinate, but different second coordinates. The same x, but different y's. So, the set that we wrote in, the relation that we wrote in set notation is not a function, because we can see that we have the same first coordinate, 1, being mapped onto the second coordinate, 2, and also being mapped on to the second coordinate, 4. So for the same x value, I have two different y values. That's not a function. Our example where we used a diagram is also not a function because our input 3 gets mapped on to negative 1. And it also gets mapped on to 0. So I have the same input being associated with two different outputs. So that's not a function. If I solve this equation for y, I can see that no matter what x value I put in here, I'm only going to get one y value. There's no way a single x value will give me two different y values. So that represents a function. And this graph also represents a function. If you look along uh, each point there and you look at the x-coordinate, uh, there is no other point on the graph that has that same x-coordinate. So let's review how we can test from looking at the graph whether or not it represents a function. We just have this vertical line test. The vertical line test says that a graph of a relation is a function if a vertical line does not intersect the graph in more than one point. And uh, that makes sense. If it does, then that means you have one x value. Remember, a vertical line has an equation of x equals some constant. And then you'd have two or more y values associated with that. 
So let's work through an example here. We have uh, five graphs of relations, and we'd like to know which ones of these are functions using the vertical line test. So the first one, that's a function. The second one, also a function. Third one, not a function. You can draw a vertical line there, for example, and it's going to hit the curve in two different places. The fourth one, function, and the last one is not a function. How do we write down functions without having to use the graph or a set? Well, we use this uh, f of x type notation. The f represents the function name. The x, or whatever is between the parentheses after the f, is the input. So let's be very careful here. The parentheses do not mean multiplication. They just are used to show us what the input is to the function. Usually it could be a number, it could be a letter, but it could also be a, another expression or something else. And then we're given a formula for the output. So let's go ahead and use this function notation and this given function, and let's evaluate. Well, first, let's just put a number as an input. If I have f of 4, now remember 4 then would be my x value. So I'm going to go ahead and replace my x in the formula with the given x value. And I'll just work that out using the order of operations. Remember, we, we use uh, exponents will come first before multiplication. So and radical 4 is 2. So let's see if I did that correct. 2 times 16 is 32. Then I subtract the 2 to get 30. All right, what about f of negative 1? Well, when I put that into the formula, I see I have to take the radical of negative 1, which is not a real number. So in this class, we'll be working exclusively with real numbers. So negative 1 is not in the domain of f. Or if I put an expression, instead of having a single number, I have x plus 1 in parentheses, or as a group, x plus 1 is my input. So I'll go ahead and replace the uh, x in the formula with the expression x plus 1. Now, I may want to clean this up, so I'm going to go ahead and remove the parentheses here, really just for practice. But over here with the radical x plus 1, there is no simplification possible. There's no way you can distribute a radical among a sum or difference under the radical sign. So that is going to have to stay radical x plus 1. But I can use FOIL, multiply out. This is worth uh, writing a little note about. Remember, we have that a plus b squared. means a plus b in parentheses times a plus b. My first outside, inside, and last And this is one of the special products that we should really have memorized, that a plus b squared is a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. And so that's how I can quickly write that as x squared plus 2x plus 2 in parentheses, because the whole thing is still being multiplied by 2. 
So why don't we go ahead and distribute the two inside the parentheses. And that'll be my final answer then. 2x squared plus 4x plus 2 minus radical x plus 1. So let's look at another take at this using uh, function notation. But really, in this example, we're going to be given an output value and asked to find input values. So we're given that g of x equals x squared minus x. And we'd like to find all values of x where g of x equals 6. Well. Rather than just doing an evaluation where we just substitute a number, here we're going to have to solve an equation because we're going to replace g of x with 6, and that's going to equal the formula x squared minus x. So now I have an equation. It's a quadratic equation. Remember, to solve a quadratic equation, we want it to equal 0. So I'll go ahead and subtract 6 from each side. I'll see if I can factor this. I could also use the quadratic formula at this point. But this one factors. And remember, why do we factor it? It's because we have this zero products property of real numbers, that if the product of two real numbers is zero, then at least one of those has to be zero. So here I have two factors inside parentheses. Their product equals zero, so at least one of them has to equal zero. If x minus 3 equals 0, then that would mean x equals 3. And if x plus 2 equals 0, that would mean x equals negative 2. All right, here's a second uh, function, h of x, which is 1 over x minus 2. We'd like to find all values of x where h of x equals 1. So again, when I'm given the output, and asked to find the inputs, I'm going to have to solve an equation. So the equation here is 1 equals 1 over x minus 2. Now, the division bar itself is a, a grouping symbol. So the x minus 2, I need to consider that as a group. But I put it in parentheses. Why? Because I'm trying to solve for x. And my next step is to multiply both sides by that group x minus 2. So the x minus 2 uh, divides out, so I'm just left with 1. So x minus 2 equals 1, and that gives me x equals 3 as the input, which gives me h of x equals 1. So h of 3 equals 1. In part a, g of 3 equals 6, but also g of negative 2 is also 6. A model that's useful for functions is to think of it as a machine. So I have my machine f. It takes x as an input. It does something to that input and produces an output. So we like to say, oh, this machine is functioning if the same input always gives you the same output. That would not be a very useful machine, except for maybe as a toy or some kind of strange game, if uh, you gave it an input and one time it gave you some uh, output and then the other time it gave you a different output. Imagine you're driving a car, you press on a brake, sometimes it slows the car down, sometimes it turns on the windshield wipers. That car would not be a function. It's not functioning. Now what we could do is then take that output and feed it into a different machine, a different function, which then does its own changes and creates its own output from the input, which was then the output from f. So we have daisy-chained these functions together. We've got one function followed by another function. And this operation is called composition. So we say that uh, 
G is composed with F. And so the first function actually is the, in the second slot. G is composed with F, is really means that G is the second function that gets evaluated. And uh, that means G of F of X. We use this little circle. Some textbooks say that they, that you're, you pronounce that as circle, G circle F. Um, but um, in my career, I've never heard anybody say that. So maybe it's a regional thing. I don't know. I just write G, I just say G composed with F or write it as G of F of X. And again, what's important is that we work from the inside out. We're going to evaluate the F function first, take that output and put it into the equation for G. Let's look at some examples. So here I have three functions, F, G, and H. And we'd like to start off with just an input as a number, f of g of 2. So I work from the inside out. Let's see what g of 2 is. g of 2 would be 2 times 2 minus 3. And using the order of operations, that'll give me 1 as the output from g. Now I'm going to take that 1 as the output from g and put it into the equation for f. And so f of g of 2 is the same as f of 1, which would be 1 squared minus 5, negative 4. Well, here we're asked to find the formula for f composed with g of x. Our input is just a generic x, an x variable. What would the output be? Well, that means for the input to my f function, I'm going to take the formula for g of x. So taking this expression, 2x minus 3, I'll replace that wherever I see an x in the f function. Now, I can clean this up. Again, I'll use my, this is a special product. This would just be a squared minus 2ab plus b squared. So I'll have 4x squared as my first term. The product is negative 6x, but I need to multiply that by 2. So it should be negative 12x and then plus 9. And then I still have the minus 5. So I can collect the like terms. And so the formula for f composed with g of x is 4x squared minus 12x plus 4. What if I change the order? What if I do g composed with f? So now f is going to be on the inside. So I will use the formula for f as input to g. Go ahead and remove the parentheses and collect the like terms. And I get 2x squared minus 13. Now note that the order of composition does indeed matter. That whether I do f composed with g or g composed with f, in general, I'm going to get a different result. All right, here we have h of g of x. h is called the reciprocal function because 1 over a number is the reciprocal of the number. So I guess we just want to find the reciprocal of the formula for g of x. And the formula for g of x is 2x minus 3. Its reciprocal would be 1 over 2x minus 3. You can compose a function with itself. So that would just mean you would take the output and then turn it around and put it back into the same function as input again. So for g of g of x, or we take this expression 2x minus 3 and put it back into the formula, that meaning that I replace that whole expression 
uh, in the place of x, let's see what I get. So I'll have 2 times 2x minus 3. Then I'll have to subtract off minus 3. So I'll go ahead and remove the parentheses and collect the like terms there. And what about h of h of x? Well, if you think about this in a minute, if I take the reciprocal of a number, and then I take the reciprocal of its the reciprocal, I should get the same number back. And so if I take h of 1 of x, I get this complex fraction, 1 over 1 over x. But remember, 1 over a number is just its reciprocal, and the reciprocal of 1 over x is just x. So that makes sense. I start off with x, take its reciprocal, then take the reciprocal of the reciprocal, I should get x back again. And so again, we'll be using this a lot, so let me write it down, that 1 over a number is the reciprocal of a number. And that concludes our video on functions and relations. We saw with functions that uh, for each x, there could be only one y. But for any y, we already saw an example where you could have two different uh, inputs give the same output. We're going to move on to the next topic in functions, which will be one-to-one -one functions, where in addition to the condition where you have for each x, there's only one y. We'd like to have for each y, there's only one x.